Beautiful. Uh, just a brief introduction here and uh, we'll get started. So um, thank you, Dr. Daryl Tonema for joining us this afternoon to provide some information about uh, managing stress and uh, trauma during this uh, COVID pandemic, um, specifically related to taking care of our uh, native uh, patients. So I'll turn it over to you to do um, um, uh, a self-introduction and let you get started. Okay. Um, my name is Daryl Tonema. I am um, from Kiowa Comanche in Tuscarora. I um, live here in Western New York. Tuscarora is just outside Niagara Falls. Uh, and I can uh, see Canada from, I walk on my office, I look right and I can see Canada right there. Um, and it's spring here today. Today is finally spring. We had winter on Saturday. Uh, I drove, drove around a snowstorm Saturday. And uh, I'm happy to be here, uh, excited to be here. Um, we wanted to uh, kind of a, a lunch and learns you want to talk about uh, kind of the role that traumas played in, in, in stressors and how that's played historically uh, in our communities. Uh, I got to talk with your uh, larger community last night about, um, about how uh, stress and can, can be exacerbated during this time, particularly if you have some pre-existing stuff. Um, and chronic stress during this time. And we don't want to switch it over to PTSD or any kind of anxiety attacks. So we uh, um, addressed that last night. And uh, as uh, Jenny and I were talking, we wanted to talk about like the historical nature of trauma uh, with the providers and how we can under understand it at, at a deeper level and kind of share. And I, and I wish this could be a, a conversation uh, that's hard to do with, with uh, technology. We're getting, it's easier if we're in the same room because I love hearing ideas and thoughts and things like this. But, um, so we're going to jump into this and just go as far as we go um, in, in an hour because this is such a big topic. And, and, I, and I had to give myself credit that, not even credit, give myself a break that um, we're probably not going to finish this conversation in an hour. Um, but it's, it is an arc of a relationship in this conversation. So when I was putting all this stuff together, I was thinking, well, let's start here. Where do we start? Well, we're, there's, there's not one road back because we, there's things that have happened in our communities. There's things that happen in our communities today that, um, our, our next generations take on, on the history of trauma in communities. Not everyone experiences the same. Um, and not every, not, not every community experiences it the same. Um, there are tribes that thrive. There's individuals that thrive. Um, but there's tribes that struggle and there's communities and individuals that struggle. And so what, what we do as providers, what I have to do as a provider, even as a native person, is not paint everything with the same brush. Um, just to have a bunch of different brushes and having to do my own homework and my own biases and my own understandings of myself and my culture and my tribe, there are 500 different, is it 500 different tribes and languages in North America? And some of those are as diverse with, within themselves as we are with the, the larger community. Uh, cultural norms and things are very different for the Seminoles than they are here in New York or from here in New York to the Hopi, um, or in the Northwest, or in the Northern Plains, it's such, such a diversity. So saying that, while well, I understand this tribe here, I am good to go. Every community I am blessed to have the opportunity to go to, I consider myself, the for myself a foreigner in that community. And my role is to humble myself and to learn as much as I can um, in a short amount of time. So with that, let's kind of look through that lens and see what we got here. So this will be the opportunity to, to begin the dialogue. Uh, like I said, we're not going to get the final place, but it's going to be 
today is about education. It's not about blame. I've done I've done trainings on historical trauma and generational trauma, and um, people are preloaded to be angry about it rather than rather than um, being open to look at the possibilities within myself. Um, we are more likely to some folks are more likely just to be angry and say, "Well, here's who I am, and here's what they need, I need to be," and that's not that's not true collaboration. And when we go to a, a community outside of us, we, or even within our communities, it's all about collaboration. So, being open to that possibility today. So, what got me thinking about this, uh, and kind of diving into the different type of trauma conversations. Um, was when I was doing diabetes work in the early 2000s, late 90s. Um, I, was, I was wondering, why do we have so much diabetes? Why the heck do we have so much diabetes? Um, and why, do we have, why the heck do we have so much cancers? And why the heck do we have so much autonomic diseases and things like this? And it just seems, the, the disparity just seems so prevalent. And I'm not gonna on in here the heater shouldn't be coming on because it's the middle of may but if it does i'm gonna can you still hear me jenny is that good i uh, yes you were breaking up just a little bit Mic here. Oh, i can't hear you if i have a microphone can you hear me when i have my microphone in uh yes okay was it any, was it any different uh you were breaking up just a little bit here and there earlier before i put it in yeah uh maybe possibly all right we'll see how it goes okay so um, that's when I started asking my, myself, why, who, what, where, when, why, how? And uh, I started diving into the research. And the is actually something unique happening in our community, the Native community as a whole, that maybe didn't happen to other communities or neighboring communities. Like here on the res here, the, here's, here's the, our res, and here's Buffalo, and Niagara Falls and Lewiston and Sanborn and our res is this little five mile, five mile by five mile dot that time forgot. And we have such higher rates in this little dot of everything you don't have high rates of heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, compared to literally a town that is a mile away. So I thought, what's that about? You can drive off the res and feel your blood sugar drop to normal levels. You drive back on and you're, you feel your cholesterol spike just by driving over the sign that says, welcome to the rural res. So there's something happened there, unique that happened. Um, but then it wasn't unique to here, it was unique to uh, the indigenous people. Um, so I kind of I kind of wanted to learn more about that. And it ended up being this, this entity called trauma. Um, and then all this research on historical trauma, which was, a lot of it was born out of the Holocaust, um, but similar attributes to the native culture. So I want to learn more about that for us and how can I, as an educator and a psychologist, do my best to mitigate as much as I can the, those things. Um, and a lot of it was a lot of self, getting over myself, uh, self introspection, uh, self care, and give myself a break, but also challenging myself to learn otherwise. So, I started with this. Uh, I'll read this to you genocide, a definition. Any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, which includes five types of criminal, act criminal actions. Killing members of the group, causing seriously bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberating, in, uh, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And as I was reading this stuff, I was like, us. that stuff happened to us. Genocide actually being imported upon the native people of North America. And that wasn't even until 1948 that it was so necessary um, to, to make laws about that. And here's, here's what's interesting. I've had so many people 
over the years say, why don't you, why don't you folks just get over it? Um, and you guys have probably heard that too. Why don't you guys just get over it? Here's what we know about epigenetics is that there's wealth of information about how trauma is stored genetically. Uh, so it's passed down from biology to psychology by traumatized parents and disempowered to sociology, beliefs about self, beliefs about health, um, beliefs about efficacy. And it's, it's very complex. And what we want to do on our side is recognize that, yes, it's a complex, more than public health problem. It, it's, it's a complex sociological, psychological, epidemiological problem. I think I want to move you guys a little bit off my screen here. Oh, I can do it too. Look at me. I don't think I muted myself. Okay. So within that, kind of doing a little more historical lesson, then you guys have heard of all this stuff, the legacy of the boarding schools then. So we, there's this genocidal, but the genocide didn't work. And so they're still here. So let's um, let's change the belief system. So many, many generations of indigenous children were sent to residential schools. This experience resulted in a collective trauma consisting of the structural effects of disrupting families, communities, the loss of parenting skills as a result of institutionalization, patterns of emotional responses resulting from the absence of warmth and intimacy in childhood, the carryover of physical and sexual abuse, the loss of indigenous knowledges, languages, and traditions, and the systemic devaluing of indigenous identity. Pause there for a second, because people will say, well, that was a long time ago. But let's, let's unravel that a little bit. Um, let's unpack it. So here's what we know in psychology and medicine and education is the, the first environment is the most critical environment for healthy brain development. The first environment is the most critical environment for healthy brain development. So if certain... Um, biological, physiological, nurturing needs, markers aren't being met, the brain adjusts, the body adjusts, the, the body recognizes at a cellular level. The, the child looks up, they do vertical um, social, social modeling and social referencing. And so if there's not warmth, if there's not protection, if they're not being held, if they're not being breastfed, everything like that, that is necessary, that is essential for healthy brain and development. If those aren't being met, the brain says, wow, the world sucks. This is a chaotic place and I need to survive. And so it adjusts. And so they're raised with this charge, this jolt of what we now call trauma that, that affects a lot of behavior. It affects the ability to learn. Um, so then these children grow up and they become parents and they haven't been taught foundational parenting skills. So then that ha starts to happen generationally. And then what happens with that is we have to, I'm not getting things met inside myself. So I use external tools to address an internal event. This thing that's happened inside of me, I use an external tool and sometimes those tools become unhealthy. That can lead to addictions and abuses and things like that. Um, but even taking it from a different perspective. So here's the child's perspective, what I just described. But take it from the community perspective. Imagine where you live, your town, your community right now, without anybody under 18 years old. Um, without any laughter, without a, really any hope, because the next generation gives us hope. And then not being able to see them. I had a, when I was out in um, Rosebud, South Dakota, just a couple months ago, we were having have a conversation with some educators. And one of them said, I think the best way I can describe what it was probably like back then is when the circus comes to winter. And winter is a border town on the res. And when the circus came to winter, all the kids went to winter. And there was only adults left in mission. Um, so he said, the best I can describe it is what if the circus came to winter and never left? That's what our community would be like. He said there was no children. And 
I've, I've kind of stewed on that's a really fascinating perspective about what what would life like be like without any young people and knowing that the young people are being uh, abused and beaten I have friends from Canada I go I do a lot of work in Canada and this legacy of residential schools um, isn't that old up there. They, um, someone was younger than me uh, was saying that she has to drive past the, the building where she was electrocuted in the basement. Um, but they, 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 she said she tried, she was sexually abused and they didn't want her to tell anybody so they put a spike in her tongue. And if, she, if they, if they told, if she t was suspected of telling anyone, they would put her in this, this chair, see this slide here, schools, electric chair, haunts, maidens. She was one of them. She said uh, most, of, most of the people in the school were put in the electric chair. It wasn't to kill, but it was to jolt. It was very uncomfortable. And she said they all had spikes in their tongues. This was in the 1980s. This wasn't in the 1920s. It wasn't in the 1800s. It was in the 1980s. Um, and she lives with that charge still today. So why don't we get over it? Because it's fresh and it's passed on in so many different ways. Uh, they were used for experiments. Uh, a lot of kids didn't survive the experiments. They were like for vaccines and things. Um, uh, so a lot, of, a lot of her friends died from vaccine testing on them. This hangs in the uh, council chambers in Newtown. North Dakota. I was up there visiting and I saw this in the chambers. Uh, they had to, they dammed up, they put in, that's what the, was the Oahe Dam? No, in North Dakota, what's the name of the Garrison Dam? I think that's right. Which uh, the three affiliated were tribes were kind of lowland folk and farmed and fished down by the river. And they put in the Garrison Dam and it flooded out their land. They lost um, island. Folks up on top of the mountain, the valley. And they, the governor said, You need to send someone to sign this. And the person crying was the one that was sent to sign it. And fascinatingly, about what I think it was four years after this was signed, the, the community had their first case of diabetes four years after this. So, Excuse me. So historical traumas, uh, traumas that are, let's look at definition. Traumas that are often intensely inflicted and occur at more or less the same time to a defined group of people. These traumas have effects like individual traumas, um, which the individual trauma is uh, my electrical charge here. So here's my, our bodies being electrical. An individual trauma, this electrical charge is, is, is going where it needs to. Uh, right now, yours is going, you're eating lunch right now, so it's probably affecting your pain right now in your digestive system, so it's going there to make sure everything's working fine. But in, so it's that all that stuff's happening in your autonomic system, it's happening all by itself. You don't have to make it do it. You don't have to make your stomach produce acids to break down your food. You don't have to make your heart beat or anything like that. It's going there on its own, it's autonomic. So, this charge then, when there's a traumatic event, this big stressor, it could be it could be an event or it could be something like occurring right now in, in the world where it's, a, it's chronic. It's not necessarily toxic for some people. For some people it is, to be honest with you. They're, they're stuck at home with their abusers, but it, it's at least chronic for everybody. It's not going away, it's staying there in this underlying gurgling level of stress. Even if you're not feeling it like it's like a building's falling on you or anything, the fact that it's novel, the fact that it's new, the fact that you don't know what to do with it, you know what to do about it, that is in itself stressful. Um, and that's what I talked about with, with the community last night. So effects like individual traumas are when this, when it recognizes stress, this just goes to the, the, the midbrain and the vagus nerve, just the vagus nerve down so we can fly or fight. You can survive the moment. You know, me surviving a moment, my heart's got to be faster because I'm going to run. I got to be hotter. I, my, my sweat glands got to open. I got to breathe heavier like I'm running. 
or I'm fighting, but we call that anxiety or stress or trauma because the amygdala is taking snapshot after snapshot after snapshot after snapshot of the event. And, and, and what we know about epigenetics is those snapshots are then passed down generationally. Um, interesting research on in humans, they found it to go down four generations. So these snapshots are passed generationally. Um, so I feel overwhelmed. So they have the same, same effect as individual traumas, but it's happening corporately to a group of people. Because the traumas are so pervasive and affect caregivers and elders, they affect community and cultural infrastructures and are targeted at a specific group, they have huge effect, a huge effect on, on people's community's ability to cope and adapt to the, the traumatic event and the aftermath. And that goes, and you can see in many communities that goes on generationally. It affects people's ability to interpret the meaning, like largely incorporating the trauma, which is a cognitive approach to, to traumatic work. Um, but let, let, me, let me make another quick statement here. A community is foundationally a bunch of people living in the same area with some, shade, with, with some shared historical experience. We call that a community. My community up on the rest here is 1,500 people that share a land base and, and kind of have similar stories together. That's what a community is. But, a, but if a high percentage of people in this community have had significant traumas, then they get passed on and then passed on. And passed on. A couple generations now, what we're living now is called historical trauma because there haven't been enough efforts or corporately to address the trauma, to get rid of the trauma. Um, patterns of trauma transmission to subsequent generations through, like I said, um, biology, psychology, biology to sociology. So cultural trauma is an attack on the fabric of society affecting the essence of the community and its members. Cumulative exposure of traumatic events, historical trauma, that affect an individual and continues to affect subsequent generations, the collective emotional and psychological injury both over the lifespan and across generations, resulting in traumatic health and history of genocide, which we find earlier. So multi-generational trauma occurs when trauma is not resolved. It's just passed on then. So it becomes intergenerational, multi-generational. It's, it, it's, again, epigenetics through sociology. So here's where our work as um, educators and providers. Um, well, let me pause even before I talk about that. Is even as a native person, I have to, whenever I go to a, a community other than my own community that I'm not from, that is on me. Because I want to do good work. Um, and I want the person that's sitting in the room with me to, I want to help them move the needle. So I have to put, put my work through cultural lenses, um, through um, me not putting it through that lens is actually another way of traumatizing, another way of oppressing. Um, because it, it, it discounts the belief of that person sitting there. So when they're talking, I put it through, through, that, um, through that lens. And I'll give you an example. I was, uh, I was out in South Dakota and um, I was, I've, I've been speaking to a lot of kids that see, that are seers. In, in the Lakota way, they call them heyokas. But they're seers, they can see spirits. And absolute 100% cultural belief. And they're, they're seeing very similar things, very similar spirits. And I, at first, and here's me being all not how I should be. My first thing was, well, it's gotta be early onset schizophrenia, or it's gotta be, they're all describing the same character, the same thing. And, and they, so I thought maybe this, this thing's on Fortnite or maybe it's on a TikTok or maybe it's a game because then I started hearing it in other places, this exact same description. I heard it in Northern Michigan. I heard it in Maine, Arizona, describing the exact same thing. And I thought, what the heck is this? And then a mother and her daughter come in and uh, 
the daughter says that she's she saw somebody die in a car accident and has seen that person around town and has seen many people who have or who have passed around town walking. Um, and the mother said that she saw the same thing. She said, we come from a family of seers. All through, all back, go back many generations, we're a family of seers. And she said, I told my doctor that what I, what I was seeing, and he put me on med, uh, psychotropic medications when I was 13 years old. And what I had to do was, was kind of balance that, like, who are the, these people? Who am I? Where am I? What is their belief system? And just because I'm having, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding it, doesn't mean they don't understand it as absolute fact. And so I had to, I had to come in from that perspective, understanding that the community is here, and they have a long history, and I am an immigrant to that community, and how can I understand that worldview better? And just the fact that I said, tell me more about that, without judgment, went so far. With those folks, it's gone so far with the other kids who are seers, um, because you you have to understand that there's difference in worldview. Um, otherwise, you'll be traumatizing. You become part of the problem. So, within understanding how the trauma role here, many adult disease should be viewed as developmental disorders that begin early in life. And that will, then that persistent health disparities associated with poverty, discrimination, maltreatment could be reduced by the alleviation of toxic stress in childhood. Ann Bullock, my friend from North Carolina, we came together. Look at this. Look how fancy it is. Huh? Is that impressive to you? How fancy this is? I hope you're impressed. Look at that. It's like sorcery. They're just showing up. Okay, intergenerational. So going back to residential schools, boarding schools, prenatal early life nutrition, poverty, prenatal substance abuse or use, child abuse, child neglect, quality of early life relationships, epigenetics. Those are the roots. And you climb the trunk and you get to the bigger branches, uh, overeating, emotional responses, alcohol use, drug abuse, and you get to the fruit of the tree. Uh, addictions, liver disease, alcoholism, violence, traumatized parenting, depression, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. And what we do often is we just pick fruit. We pick fruit, we pick fruit, we pick fruit, we pick fruit. Um, and in our communities, just keep picking fruit and it's going to grow back again next year. That's the nature of fruit. That's why we were having these same conversations now that my dad had with that I've had with my dad and he had with his dad. Um, so here's a cool saying. Are you ready? You can have this tattooed someplace if you want, but you don't have to. You're not going to fix the fruit till you change the root. No, I'm going to change that. You're not going to change the fruit till you fix the root. You're not going to change the fruit till you fix the root. And understanding that a history of trauma has established much of those roots. Um, and in high ACE scores, adverse childhood experiences, you guys know about ACE, ACE scores, but we know that the high ACE scores lead to addictions, they lead to suicide attempts, they lead to poor parenting, they lead to dis-ease, and everything, everything we're looking at is self-medication, 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 self-medication. So some behaviors we see with these high ACE scores with, with the traumatized community, distrust, a sense of never having enough. We spend, eat, use what we have now because it may be taken from you. And you probably know people like that in your own families. Um, the, <laughs> my, my friend here on the rents, he, uh, he has to decide if he's going to uh, pay for his electric bill or if he's going to get $200 sunglasses. And guess what he got? He's got nice sunglasses. We're not live to be old, so it doesn't matter what we do now. And that's that's where it's it's difficult for prevention in in traumatized communities because prevention assumes 
that there's a future. And lack of lack of understanding of generational. If we're on survival mode, if we're on survival mode, I need to live this moment. And you're talking about 20 years from now. That those don't go together in traumatized communities. Love is not to be trusted. It's often linked with emotional, physical, sexual abuse. There's a different threshold for normal behaviors, what is perceived as normal, which can be very dangerous in others, uh, in other cultural groups. Anger or rage is out of proportion to the situation. This is the limbic system, uh, the swollen limbic system, um, which is the emotional center of the brain. Uh, trauma, when, when trauma is occurring, it swells. And so they have a hair trigger. And a lot of, a lot of times, things with, Symptoms of swollen limbic are people will say things like, I don't know why they got that mad about that. I don't know why they freaked out that much. Um, and it's just a symptom of trauma. Dissociation, desensitized to loss because loss. Our community here, even previous to, to um, COVID, I don't know if we've been done mourning in years. It's, 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 Happening again and again and again and again. The, the tusk flag is always at half mass. Distrust of providers. Why? Because you are part of the system. Um, you are part, if it's an IHS system or the system that we've been handed, um, and it came out of the War Department in the, um, the language that was written in was we were wards of the state. Meaning we could not take care of ourselves, so um, others must take care of us. Written in the War Department. Um, which means that the, the power was forded over uh, a group of people and options were limited for a group of people. Now, put that into how we do our practice. You have to do this, you need to go do this, you have to go do this, this is you, you have to do this. That's plays right into a history of that type of relationship. And that's why we get so much resistance. Um, and a lot of people say, we have to work. Yes, but do your work smarter, do it differently. You can get to the same place by having a different approach. Or they become overly dependent on the provider for the reasons I was just expressing, that we were wards of the state. And so we feel like, oh, we just have to listen to them. We just have to listen. So there's a, there's, I've noticed the significant lack of uh, healthcare literacy. Like, what is what are my rights as a patient? What what can I say? Can I say no to you sometimes, as as a patient? Uh, patients saying they're doing things, or taking meds, I say, but they aren't, or they or they are denying something that they are eating healthy foods, drinking that kind of thing. But some of the sociological challenges. Um, Family, cultural beliefs about medicine, um, about uh, health care, about education. Um, that's the white man's medicine. That's a white man's education. Then they have every right to say those things. Uh, that's, that is their right to, ha to have that position. Um, and that, that level of vigilance, uh, it makes sense if you put it through the cultural, historical lens. A cultural stress level of assimilation. Uh, we force patients to assimilate to the rules of the clinic, and that's just the system that that we were raised in. We were like as we were adopted into a system in the 1940s, and that hasn't changed that much since then. I mean, technology's changed, but the belief system behind it hasn't really changed. Um, so the clinic has has a history of stress and and in, in our communities if one person has a bad experience at the clinic you know that everybody else in the community finds out about it and it's it's um it affects people wanting to come to the clinic wanting to be seen there um because they'll say this is how they treat people there fair or not um they're just being vigilant uh, changing cult cultural habits, uh, norms are sociological challenges. 
the urban sprawl is a, is a, is a soci sociological challenge. Uh, and even urban sprawl has occurred even rurally because of social media and the access to information, uh, different types of music and belief systems, and films and things like that. So urban sprawl is kind of a, can kind of, kind of start becoming an outdated term because that sprawl is more than just building, it's, it's, it's beliefs and that, that is pervasive now. Language and transportation barriers, if there, if there are urban or even rural, but working a bus system in rural and urban, urban setting. Social economic statuses, social ethical challenge. Um, and I want to go to microaggressions. Let me see how much more time I have. We all have enough time. It's possible that we are perpetuating trauma without really knowing it in education or, or healthcare. Um, the way that is transmitted in education is through books. Uh, the, the victor writes the story. And so in, in textbooks, uh, it's, it's uh, passed on. Teaching style, uh, huge, probably unnecessarily huge, uh, broad stroke is we have different learning styles um, maybe less verbal i know there's um in um i think karen swisher had done research on educators and they would the educator would ask a question and the native students wouldn't answer immediately other students the non-native students were raising their hands like this and the native students wouldn't answer immediately, so there was a pause. And the teacher, the teachers and the research assumed it was an unintelligent pause, that they didn't understand or they didn't know, but um, kind of thematically found it was a thoughtful pause, that they want, they just wanted to say something, just to say something, it was a pause to think, well, is this true? And so it was a thoughtful pause. There were assumptions about students based on um, the pausing, the hair. Um, I know uh, microaggressions, which were assumptions, and I'll talk about micro microaggressions more in a little bit, but I know that when I was in college, I was asked the question, question many times, so Daryl, what, what do the natives think about this? I was asked that question a lot of times. What do the natives think about this? And, and I would say, well, we all got together and here's what we decided, which I think that made the, the teacher realize that it's kind of a nonsense statement. It's like me saying, so what do all white people think about what I'm saying right now? Which was a microaggression. How does healthcare transmit um, misunderstanding traditions? We had uh, one of the big things we had trouble with when I was doing diabetes work in Arizona was blood, use of blood. Uh, because it was sacred to the Navajo, and so it couldn't be stored. It couldn't be stored or transported. Uh, they had a, the sites on the, on the Navajo has had a lot of problem with that. Um, with with our, we can have our best intentions, but we still go in with our assumptions. Um, and this is where we do our own our own self work, because we have to be aware of our own assumptions and our own intentions. Um, Maybe we don't know community norms. And even if you have, I get this question a lot. Is it okay for me to ask? Um, yes, uh, asking respectfully, but sometimes I say, just wait, just wait. And just observe, and wait and see what happens and wait. But the only way that you observe and see what happens and and I always encourage this, and I do this myself when I go to communities. I go to their basketball games. I'll go to their graduations. I'll, I'll hang out because um, I have to be seen. I have to earn my right in the community. Um, but learning community norms, uh, being present in the community, engaging in the community, and not engaging, I have to have all the attention or I'm, I'm going to just sit back. Sit back and wait, sit back and see what evolves, sit back and learn, sit back and learn slowly. Um, become patient. 
Um, one of the ways that we, we transmit traumas is, um, I've had so many people say that they were re-traumatized or traumatized by leaning back in the doctor's office or in the dental chair. Um, that they were, if they were abused sexually or physically and they were leaning back on, on the table or into a chair and somebody dominant was over them, that, that was very reactivating for them. Things that we don't even know we're doing. And a lot of this has the best intentions. I'm sure you have good hearts. Um, so it's, 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 it's not out of uh, lack of good intentions. It's just lack of knowing and being a little more patient. So microaggression, which is, is a relatively newer term, but I think it's an interesting term. A statement, action, or incident regarded as an instance of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group, such as racial or ethnic minority. Um, and it happens often. It happens to, it happens to me often. What? Yeah. Um, I get pulled over a lot uh, for ridiculous reasons uh, when I leave the rest. I get pulled over. I was one time I was driving um, too close to the solid line over here. There was nobody else on the road, but I was driving too close to that line. So they had to pull me over. One time I was pulled over because I was passing a car on a highway and I signaled, did the whole thing, passed the car, and came back over, and I got pulled over. And the police officer said, when you pass the, when you pass the car, you have to, um, it has to be six lines that you pass before, it, and you only did four. So I was pulled over for that reason. So these, I know that's not the reason, it was ridiculous. Um, one time I was pulled over because you're not from around here. So it's, it's sometimes, just being brown in town is a little stressful. So microaggressions, examples, being asked if you're a real Indian. Are you a real Indian? By a non-native person. I've been asked that question. Uh, being asked to prove your Indianness or authentic authenticity by a non-native person. Being asked by a stranger if he or she could touch you because you are native. Being asked by a non-native stranger if you could perform a ceremony or contact a medicine person for him or her. I've been asked that. Um, feeling invisible to non-natives, teaching Indian 101 to non-natives to make your point or be heard, which I had to do in college a lot, being asked to change your native appearance or apparel by your employer or agency, hearing from non-natives how surprisingly articulate, well-read, and good your language skills are. Um, and let me pause there for a second. You guys are probably familiar with code switching. Um, where you, you speak differently among one group as opposed to your group of origin. And just so you know, when I go back to the rest, I don't say group of origin. I'm, I'm using language here with you guys that I don't, I don't use there. And I had, to get, I had to get comfortable as a native person saying, it's okay for me to code switch. It's okay for me to use different language and types of language and have it be okay and still be native and have that be okay. Um, as well as it's okay for us as providers to make sure that we are speaking, co switching codes with them, making sure that we're understandable as well as, because when you go up there, when you go to the res, we, it creates a wall if, if I'm not, understand, not understandable or if I'm not in that code. Um, non natives stating that you don't look like or act Indian. And I've had my friends. Uh, from the res here, one of them is a little lighter skinned and people at the border of Canada. He said he lived on the Tuscarora Nation and they said, you don't look native. So he reported them. Hearing discussions by persons in authority about Indians as if they no longer exist. So in our last little section here, healing activities in Indian country. Um, traditional healers, traditional helpers um, are healing conferences. Uh, there's circles of care, there's systems of care, there's, there's, there's systems of care that are, that are using traditional healers as, as part of the, the care system. In, in the um, 
telepsychology that 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 is my work. Uh, we have psychiatry and psychology and uh, drug and alcohol counselors, and we have uh, traditional healers as part of our team because that takes down a barrier, and some people want to use those tools. And promoting resilience, um, spirituality, family strength, um, accessing elders, bring ceremony back to the communities, back to the health centers, respecting the oral traditions, the tribal identity, the kind of things that, that I experienced in working with the seers. And if, if, you, want, if you need to stay in a comfort zone, um, some strength-based approaches. And I like motivational interviewing. It's very cognitive, and there's a lot of there's a lot of assumptions about cognitive work here. And there. But motivational interviewing is is very not specific, and it allows it allows client or patient to work in the in the sphere that they can put their culture in that sphere. So I really like motivational interviewing. I like systems work, Mnuchin's work, um, because we we live in systems uh, in tribal community, clan systems, family systems. And so understanding that we work within systems as tribal people, I think that's, uh, that's empowering. Dialectical um, acceptance and commitment therapy and traditional met methodologies of those, I, my, my favorites are motivational interviewing and systems approach. What do we do as providers? And I consider myself a provider as well, along with you guys. And like I said, I go to many communities and it's my job. I get paid to go to a community and help and help move the needle. And if I'm if I'm making barriers that are going to limit the success, I I need to acknowledge those within myself. Uh, so confronting my own biases. Um, Tuscaroras are very different than Navajos. Uh, worldview, belief systems, and um, I have to understand that sometimes those get in the way. So then, but I'm the one being paid to be there. So I have to understand that for myself. Learn the community, that's gonna help us. Being seen in the community, being seen as a member of the community. Humble ourselves, kind of get out of our own way sometimes and just wait, just wait. Um, I may not know. Um, that medicine man may know a lot more about it than I do. That, that Hayoka is gonna know a lot more about that than I do. Um, so what happened with those kids is that I went and talked to somebody, an adult Hayoka, and that person said, this is absolute fact. And here's what you need to learn about it. Quiet education, um, being patient. Um, in, in traditional ways, the, in, in, part of, in, in the storytelling method, um, knowledge evolved. It wasn't, if, if in storytelling, oral tradition culture, knowledge was shared in metaphor, and usually using animals, actually. My dissertation was on storytelling. So it was uh, used to let the information bloom in you. And it wasn't a multiple choice or true or false answer. It was a value that was blooming, an understanding of it that was blooming. So if we're patient, it blooms. Um, adjust our own thoughts and adjust our own efforts about those thoughts. Build trust, be consistent over time. Um, consider our, our time and our communities as an arc instead of, instead of a moment in our communities. And if we, can, if, we, if we look at these things as a whole, and everything we talked about today, like I said, this is the beginning of a conversation. We could, we could sit around a table and eat our lunches together, and I think this would be a fascinating conversation. Because you could say the same thing about your, your culture of origin. Um, you bring those values as well. The question is, how, what can I do to help move the needle most for the person sitting across from me? And if I need to get out of my, out of my own way sometimes, then that's, that's what I'm going to have to do. So my final slide. Um, you did then what you knew how to do. And when you knew better, you did better. And really, that's ongoing life education, is we um, consider, we learn, and we consider, and we learn, and we consider, and then we change, and we implement. I, I love this slide. And I love the challenge that working in diverse communities brings us. And you guys are doing, bless you guys for wanting and committing to working with, with our peoples. It's not easy. And 
and you probably feel underappreciated often, but it is even even if and I know the people who come to our clinic here, they probably feel underappreciated. More complained about than anything, probably. But you are appreciated. It's just a, it's a process. It's, it's, it's a relationship that grows over time. Do we have, well, I know we have a few minutes left. Jenny, did you want to have any questions or comments or thoughts or anything? Uh, yeah, we can open it up if you have uh, a few minutes to answer any questions. I don't have any questions in the chat, so if anybody wants to unmute themselves, feel free to. I can give my email. I'd like to give my email um, and just keep in touch. If you have any thoughts or questions that, that you'd like to ask me personally, um, my email, should I write it on here? I think I will. I do have a question. Okay. So I work um, at the Healing Lodge of the Seven Nations here in Spokane, Washington. And I know as a mental health provider, I've sort of had to change um, how I address trauma um, and any pointers on that. And, and the way that I've had to change it is sort of um, in a way I'm very open about what I do have to report and what I don't, you know? Um, and so we've actually, you know, I have this whole thing of, of, you know, we can talk about the trauma without pointing fingers, which has seemed to work a little bit better, but any sort of pointers on like individual therapy and how to get around it, because um, there are a lot of the times talking about the trauma really needs to happen, but they need to do it in a way that isn't going to incriminate, which a lot of the times, you know, um, that will happen. Um, and so we talk about it in a roundabout way, but any, like I said, any pointers that you have? Oh, absolutely. Um, have you read um, Trauma Through a Child's Eyes or Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine? I think I've done Waking the Tiger, but not the other one. If you, I'm going to write that down. So when, when I do trauma work with people, sometimes I'll tell them I don't need to know the story. And that's what I said in the past, yeah. And so, but in not needing to know the story, then what are we working with? We're working the sensation base. Um, which is where it's stored. That's, that's what electrical charge is stored is the sensation base. So it's the, we're, we're trying to say, here's the narrative and here's the sensation base, but we're trying to separate those things actually because of the sensation base that sucks. That, that's what makes me uncomfortable. The story is just a narrative that happened a long time ago. It's not happening now, but it's the sensation base that they are so uncomfortable with. So in somatic work, it's, uh, you, you deal more with this part of it than the narrative part of it. Yeah. So, that, so I focus on the sensation base primarily. And we do a lot of, um, uh, yeah, I do a lot of that. Where is it in the body sort of, um, you know, I did a great yeah. one. He keeps the score. So that's kind of the basis, I guess, that I would be working with. Yeah. Anything, anything by Van der Kolk or Levine um, where it focuses on the neck down instead of the neck up. Yeah. That, so that, that, that takes away the narrative. Thank you. Oh, you bet. Well, there's my email for you folks. If I would love to have keep having conversations with you guys, um, we we are of the same tribe of providers, um, so we support each other and care for each other. And um, if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, I would love to keep talking with you guys. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tonema. Um, this is Jenny with Better Health Together. I just wanted to note that we'll have another session with uh, Dr. Tonema on Friday, another Lunch and Learn. Um, he'll go through uh, the information um, that he presented today, maybe a little bit different. He likes to change things up, I'm sure. So um, please feel free to um, join that session again or have other colleagues join. Um, we look forward to engaging with you. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone.